Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. This 25-year-old patient complained of mild temporomandibular joint pain and discomfort, particularly on the left side of her face. The symptoms had become increasingly severe during a recent period of stress. She was also aware of bruxing. The patient should be placed in a slightly reclined position for the examination. The head should rest comfortably with a secure support for the occipital ridge. There should be no strain on the neck muscles, and the patient should be told to relax her arms and shoulders. The head should be in line with the trunk of the body. Observe the musculature. Tremors in the masseter and temporal muscles often may be observed in patients with bruxism and high muscle tonus. Have the patient open and close the mandible slowly. This movement normally should be smooth and unrestricted without any lateral deviation. Notice the jerky movements in this patient with the chin shifting from one side to the other. Note the condyle regions while observing the chin movements. Notice the muscle strain during extreme movements. Have the patient move laterally with the mandible open. Note the inhibited strained movements. Lateral and protrusive mandibular movements with the teeth in contact should be unrestricted and glide smoothly. This movement has a slightly irregular pattern, guided by the rounded facets on the tips of the cuspids. The temporomandibular joint region is palpated during opening and closure and lateral movements. Note the jerky deviations from a normal smooth pattern. The jerkiness can also be seen with the teeth in contact. The musculature is palpated beginning with the masseter. The insertion of the medial pterygoid muscle is palpated under the angle of the jaw. Tenderness is looked for in the temporal muscles. Patients with occlusal dysfunction often exhibit tenderness in the sternocleidomastoid muscles and their area of attachment at the mastoid process. The pattern of speech should be observed. In this instance, it is slightly strained. Intraorally, the anterior border of the medial pterygoid muscle is palpated. The possible presence of maxillary and mandibular tori is explored. Observe the buccal mucosa and the lateral border of the tongue. It often shows tooth marks and papillitis in patients with occlusal dysfunction. The teeth are tested for mobility. Several of these teeth had slight increases in mobility associated with the patient's bruxism. Test percussion with the handle of an instrument. Teeth in traumatic occlusion often have a dull percussion sound compared to the clear, sharp sound from normal teeth. 
Examine the attrition facets for direction and extent of wear patterns. Ledges of wear on the anterior teeth of the maxilla and mandible are associated with her bruxism. When there are symptoms of occlusal discomfort or pain, the patient is asked to move the jaw into the position where it hurts, and the location of the soreness is sought. The rest position should be recorded with the patient sitting in an upright position. Have the patient relax and say, Mississippi, and swallow. With a Bowley gauge, the rest vertical dimension is recorded as the distance between the reference marks on the skin. The patient is then asked to bite together in centric occlusion to record the occlusal vertical dimension. The distance between the rest vertical and the occlusal vertical dimension can be read on the gauge. This is called freeway or inter-occlusal space. Centric relations should be recorded with the patient resting comfortably in the dental chair. The back rest should be reclined to about 65 degrees. Have the patient open the jaw and place the thumb on the lower incisor teeth and the remaining fingers under the chin. Start to bring the jaw back to the retrusive border path with slight pressure on the teeth and chin. Have the patient hold the tongue against the anterior aspect of the palate to avoid tongue guidance. Only when complete relaxation of the jaw has been achieved should the operator bring the mandible up to the maxilla on the terminal hinge path. The fingernail is used to prevent occlusal contact initially. When the terminal hinge movement can be made by the operator without muscle activity by the patient, the finger can be moved down until the teeth make contact. After the initial contact in centric relation, the patient should be asked to bite or squeeze the teeth together. The slide or shift from the hinge path or centric relation to centric occlusion is the so-called slide and centric. This patient has a small forward slide and centric. There is also a slight lateral shift or slide and centric, although the shift is mainly in an interior direction. In order to locate the initial contacts in centric relation, place slightly heated 28 or 32 gauge wax on the teeth and tap the mandible into light occlusal contact in centric relation. Don't let the patient bite together. Remove the wax with a cotton pliers whose beak is oriented to a landmark such as a cusp on the first molar. Observe which teeth penetrated the wax and which teeth almost penetrated. Repeat the procedure on the other side. Do not let the patient bite together during this recording. As long as the recording is controlled by the operator, one may do one side at a time. The wax bite is removed using the mesial buccal cusp of the first molar as a landmark. The premature contacts are on the lingual cusp of the upper first and second bicuspids while the molars are almost touching. Prematurities can also be marked with carbon paper. Although this does not determine the prematurities as accurately as wax, sharp distinct tapping will give good carbon marking. The marks are on the mesial aspect of the lingual cusp of the first bicuspid, the lingual cusp of the second bicuspid, and the mesial aspect of the triangular ridge on the first maxillary molar. 
The corresponding marks are on the distal aspects of the buccal cusps of the mandibular bicuspids and first molar. Tests should also be made for premature contacts in centric occlusion. This is done by placing wax on the posterior teeth on both sides and having the patient bite or tap together very lightly in centric occlusion. The initial contacts can be seen on the first molar on the left side and on the right side, the lingual cusp of the second maxillary molar. Touching the teeth lightly while the patient taps the teeth together will often reveal premature contact in centric occlusion if there is a lateral impact or shift during full closure. Light palpation of the teeth while the patient moves into lateral excursions may also reveal interferences as a slight displacement of the interfering teeth. Protrusive movement should also be tested. Premature contacts in lateral excursions are located with casting wax. Right lateral movement from centric occlusion is recorded first. The record demonstrates contacts of the right maxillary cuspid and the left second molar. The perforation of the wax indicates heavy balancing on the left second molar. The left lateral excursion is recorded similarly. Contact is noted on the right second molar of the balancing side and on the left cuspid on the working side. These procedures can be repeated with carbon paper. The right lateral excursion shows heavy balancing contact on the lingual cusp of the second molar. And working contact on the cuspid. The left lateral excursion from centric occlusion with carbon paper shows heavy balancing contact on the lingual cusp of the right second maxillary molar against the mesiolingual incline of the distobuccal cusp of the mandibular second molar. A grooved facet has been worn into this tooth. Note the facet pattern related to the working side contact on the left cuspid and lateral excursion. Right and left lateral excursions in the retrusive water range are recorded. No penetrations of the wax are seen. Finally, we have the patient chew wax in the various areas of the mouth to observe the chewing patterns. This patient has a strained and somewhat clumsy chewing pattern on the left side. Note the heavy masseter and mentalis action associated with the hypertonicity of the muscles. A complete set of periapical rentgenograms and posterior bite wings should be examined for signs related to trauma from occlusion. Look for the relationship of the alveolar crest to the cemento enamel junction, the continuity of the lamina dura over the alveolar crests, and around the roots of the teeth. Note the width of the periodontal space, especially in the crestal, bi, and trifurcation areas. Examine carefully the surface morphology of the roots and the crown root ratio. Look for evidence of periapical pathology and observe the trabecular pattern of the supporting bone. Indication from trauma from occlusion is seen in the bite wings. The mesial aspect of the right maxillary first bicuspid has a funnel-shaped widening of the periodontal space with loss of lamina dura at the mesial cervical quarter of the root. 
This is sometimes called an angular bone defect. Note also slight loss of lamina dura at the mesial crestal aspect of the first molar. The uneven marginal ridge height between the first molar and second bicuspid is not pathologic. It is related to the uneven height of the cemento enamel junction of these teeth. A slight widening of the periodontal space is present at the bifurcation of the first molar. The bite right wing rentgenograms from the left side also display a slight widening of the periodontal space at the mesial cervical area of the first bicuspid and the first molar. Such slight rentgenographic findings are not diagnostic of trauma from occlusion, but should be related to clinical findings. Rentgenograms of the temporomandibular joint may also be helpful in a complete examination. One should have at least three separate exposures for each temporomandibular joint. Rest position, centric occlusion, and maximal mandibular opening. Observe the position of the condyle relation to the glenoid fossa and the articular tubercle. Study the definition of the functioning surfaces of the joint, the condyle, the articular eminence, and the glenoid fossa. These structures are well defined and without any evidence of pathologic changes. No evidence of arthritis, neoplastic disease, or fracture is seen in this x-ray. Minor changes in condylar position from rest position to centric occlusion are of no significance. Comparison of condylar size and shape between the two sides is also meaningless due to a normal anatomical asymmetry. Extreme forward condylar position in maximal opening is not significant in diagnosis of subluxations. The position of the condyle in front of the articular tubercle in this rentgenogram is normal. In maximal opening of the mandible, the anterior placement of the condyle should be approximately symmetrical for both sides. Often with temporomandibular joint pain, the condyle of the painful joint lags behind. With the evaluation of the rentgenograms, the occlusal examination is complete. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu license.